Okay, well, welcome everyone. We're very happy to have you with us in the second session of the Contemporary Architecture of the Muslim World online course. Um, I'm Seifer Rashidi from the Barakat Trust, and we're very happy today that we have three guests um, who'll talk about modernity in two different parts of the world. Firstly, Abdurrahman and Turki Gazaz of Brick Lab, uh, who are based in Jeddah, but currently in Berlin. And they're going to talk about modernity and modern architecture in Jeddah. And Danny Wishaksono, who is based in Indonesia, and he's going to talk about uh, the history of modernity and the rise of modern architecture in Indonesia. And then we'll follow that with a conversation and reflection on similarities and differences and connections. Um, and we thought that it would be an interesting way to think about the issues of modernity by looking at um, two places that are geographically distinct and quite far away from each other um, to think about how there are similarities and also differences. So uh, Abdurrahman and Turki will start with you um, and you're welcome to say more about yourselves and your practice um, if you like. Um, and we're very interested and keen to hear your reflections and observations on Jeddah. Um, and which is the result of long and very passionate research on the subject. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. And thank you, Steph, again for uh, inviting us to be part of this uh, very interesting series of lectures. Um, uh, we are part of Brick Lab, uh, a multidisciplinary architecture practice that's based in Jeddah. Um, and we have recently, uh, and that's uh, we met with Yusef actually starting um, an archival research uh, called uh, Saudi Modern, which archives modern architecture. And that's something uh, that has been an ongoing um, series of, of, of research topics and investigations on modernity. And I think that's what we're going to be talking to everyone about today. Um, so let us uh, share our screen. Um, yeah, go on, go on with the introductions while I share my screen to key. Um, so yeah, um, at Brick Lab, we're really curious about the uh, built environment, and that really uh, uh, helps us identify topics of uh, research and uh, and and we're uh, in inquiries into uh, what is the history, what is what what is what are the social implications of this built environment, and. So we look at uh, modern histories, and especially the interesting period that we looked at is the uh, the early transitional period of uh, the city of uh, Jeddah as oil was first discovered, and the city really started to transform from a traditional walled city into an urban, uh, into a, a sprawling metropolis of uh, over a million inhabitants. Um, so the topic that we are going to talk to be talking to you about today is modernities and identities, and we um, we wanted to go with a playful take on saying let us not remember Jeddah. Uh, Jeddah currently is undergoing um, a lot of demolitions um, because we're sharing this. They can see our whole screen, so that's why I yeah. Um, so we'll tell you a little bit about uh, Jeddah. So this is. Uh, this is what we'll be circling back to at the very end. This is the pilgrimage um, uh, building, accommodation building, pilgrim, pilgrim's accommodation building in Jeddah, which has been recently demolished. Uh, in Jeddah, there was uh, recently there was the Islamic Arts Biennale, which was being, which was hosted in the um, Al Khan award-winning tented structure, uh, which is the. Uh, the Hajj accommodations, the Hajj terminal, the Hajj in, terminal at Jeddah. Um, it was a, it was a new, it was a new piece of uh, Hajj infrastructure that was introduced in the eighties. Uh, the building that we see on the screen here is that is the first kind of uh, modern Hajj infrastructure project um, built in the nineteen fifties, uh, where pilgrims come in, they stay before they're being shuttled to Mecca, and it's. Uh, one of the symptoms of what's been happening to Jeddah uh, over the, between 2020 and 2022, where mass, uh, where large parts of the city were um, were demolished to make way for new development, and it kind of uh, propel, propels uh, a new chapter about the history of the city, and that's why we're compelled to document what was uh, what was there. 
So just to uh, give you an overview, uh, Jeddah up until the 1930s was mostly a, a, a small walled city of not more than 20, 15,000 people uh, at most. There are a few villages scattered around, um, each one with a different type of uh, uh, community. So, um, and we can see this is a, a map from the uh, British legation at the time in the, I think, 1933. And you can see uh, some of the main uh, parts of the city. Um, the architecture was really um, was a really traditional uh, coral stone um, and uh, teak wood, uh, <clears throat> very uh, very particular of the uh, Red Sea. So a lot of uh, it shares a lot of characteristics with different cities along the Red Sea, and is very emblematic of that trade. And on the right, you can see a picture of. Um, a building that was built in the uh, in the mid thirties, um, which is a reinforced concrete building, but really borrows a lot of the same characteristics of the traditional um, the traditional Dowry house. And uh, in terms of uh, planning and morphology, it's uh, very traditional. But in terms of materiality, uh, it's uh, it's very new. Um, in that sense. And you see it sitting up against uh, a modern structure as well. So you see that there becomes uh, once you'll see in the in the next couple of slides, once once the wall of Al Balad has fell, Al Balad is, is what is termed for for the, the walled city or the old city uh, in Jeddah. Uh, some emergence of modern constructions began to to uh, uh, to appear. Um, a very interesting uh, integration or, or a very interesting natural occurrence of modern construction started to uh, to sit very sympathetically uh, become prominent. Um, and it's, it, it, it started to become a very interesting place. And that of course became, became very prominent because of these certain agreements that became, that started happening very naturally. So the uh, once the oil concessions were um, were signed between uh, the Saudi state and uh, oil companies um, in Texas and New York, the the country really uh, jumped into a, an, an an era of, eco of economic uh, boom that was unprecedented at the time. And the and I think we're showing this picture because it's uh, very symbolic of the changes to come. Uh, so. <clears throat> Up until so by nineteen uh, so by nineteen fifty nine, uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman Makhlouf was appointed an, an Egyptian urban uh, planner who studied in Switzerland was appointed by the United Nations Development Program um, <clears throat> to provide a master plan for Jeddah. And that marked that first step towards implementing a planning framework for for the city and the first kind of outline or skeleton that gives it its shape today. So when he was commissioned, he did uh, a very thorough survey of our Jeddah looked like, and he spent, I think, around four years between 1959 and 1964 to, to study the city and really understand how it, uh, understand uh, how it expanded, what type of populations lived there, what, and what it needs. And as you can see here, you still, I don't know if you can see the, uh, our mouse hovering, but you see the lagoon and the walled city and the expansion of Jeddah in the 1950s. Again, going back to what we first started telling you about the efforts that we've been doing back in our office at Brick Lab in, in, in Saudi Modern, these, this is the survey that Abdurrahman Bakhtouf has done that we have digitized within our archives, just to give you some sort of backdrop. And, you know, these are some of the photographs he was taking. It was really interesting because you can see on the picture on the left, there is the traditional house um, using coral stone and uh, wood with a mishrabiya. And then you have really modern buildings, um, office spaces and, and shopping uh, centers. But also at the same time, there were a lot of, because of the influx of uh, low income workers and people who are, uh, moving from different villages from around the country to sort of be part of this economic boom. Um, the, they were also some very, um, you know, 
shacks that were and sort of districts where it was mostly makeshift housing for uh, for people. And really, I think it was a period when um, you know the first modern uh, the first modern uh, port or dock was built, um, and uh, hotels. The uh, again the Hajj uh, uh, pilgrim uh, building uh, next to the airport, and also some developments that are happening in the north of the city. So, I mean, an influx of people started coming into Jeddah. So with this influx of people and a, a, a brand new so- sort of architecture started to emerge, a brand new style started to come into play. Modernity started taking a, a, a very interesting form. Um, and that's, that's I think, a, a new form of, of architectural identity started to emerge within the city. Um, and I think that's why Jeddah started to really take on a form um, that is more sort of tied in, tied in with, with the pilgrims, which I think is quite interesting with the pilgrimage route, the trade route. It was an influx of people coming in from different places with these different ideas that gave modernity um, sort of a voice, which made the city very interesting quite quickly. Obviously, urban sprawl and kind of the the, the sort of the the, the spur of, of oil made the city kind of sprawl quite quickly. And you can see that in terms of architectural identity, or let's say uh, an architectural language, the it was really something that was evolving. So on the on the top, you know, on the top left, you can see that there is a, an attempt to to design the keep with a certain with a strong motif of arches, uh, pointed arches or onion shaped arches, um, and then the Hajj, the pilgrim accommodation building, is a very modern, uh, straightforward building, and so is this uh, the new hotel. Um, and this is the plan that Dr. Abdurrahman Makhlouf uh, proposed, and uh, you can see this is the old city, um, these existing neighborhoods, and then I think the major uh, move that was uh, that really changed the future of the city was the decision to move the airport in this large plot, um, almost 30 minutes away from the uh, old uh, center. So, and that really, um, and that decision really pulls uh, the uh, the dev- pulls expansion of the city northwards, and really <clears throat> uh, creates a series of new neighborhoods uh, that occupy um, this northern expansion. Um, and this is a this is a map of Jeddah that was produced in the nineteen seventies by uh, Zaki Farsi. And he was at the time he he was the the brother or cousin of Muhammad Said Farsi, Jeddah's mayor. And Muhammad Said Farsi is really one of the key figures that um, really uh, pushed Jeddah into uh, its new identity as the bride of the Red Sea, and <clears throat> really promoted it as a tourist um, a city, really facing. Uh, the waterfront. Again, this is a reconstruction of of his maps that we've that have been done. So at, at Brick Lab, we do a lot of re- these reconstructions. We've reconstructed it with uh, with the tented structure of the graphic designers that that have done the, the image in in an effort to kind of document uh, different mappings of Jeddah. And this is just overlapping Abraham Mahdouf's investigations on what Jeddah looks like today, just to give you a little bit of a perspective. Um, and you can see that the city, even from the 1970s, it expanded further north and further south. So, um, <clears throat> so it's been changing over time. And some of, and I'll we'll just circle back uh, to uh, show you some of the building type, some of the buildings that we documented during our research, and uh, we are showing the. Uh, this interesting housing project, which was built in the 1940s, <clears throat> that was that first kind of moment where subsidized housing was offered for Saudi citizens. 
And what's interesting here is that it is located next to uh, one of the traditional gates of the city, uh, Bab Sharif, which is the southern gate. And on the top left, there are parts of the <clears throat> traditional urban fabric. And in the bottom right, these are one of the neighborhoods that were that have expanded in in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, this is Al uh, Al Hindawiya. So you can see that there is a very, it was a very interesting moment in time where you have the traditional, um, the modern, but also a modern that takes on traditional forms as well. And these are just different styles of architecture that we just wanted to very quickly uh, run through just to give you uh, a, almost like a, a, a tactile but visual sense of what, uh, modernity in Jeddah takes on different forms in different urban configurations, um, different color palettes, whether it be it um, residential or commercial buildings. Uh, these are just certain pages of different things in Saudi modern that we've done as well. So this is when um, we're, um, I would also mention the Karim, building, because yeah. this is a Sayyid Karim building that was uh, within the 1950s. Yeah was uh, the, uh, the center for uh, printing and publishing. And it was this kind of modern uh, center where journalists would come in. And uh, uh, this was one of the, some of the leading newspapers at the time and uh, were published here. And their choice of, uh, of appointing Sayyid Karim really says a lot about this kind of moment where there is a future outlook and uh, engagement with other modernities that are happening uh, across the Arab world. And I mean, it's also interesting to see how that building transformed today. Uh, I think for us, in terms of how you see a building transforming over time is still part of uh, modernity. It's it's not that our approach is not saying that let's turn it back to what it looks like. Yeah, it, it looks great how it used to look like, but there is something quite interesting on what it looks like, how it looks like today. Um, circling back to um, these parts of, of the Hajj terminal, I think is quite interesting. Obviously, a big portion on the left has been demolished. I don't know why you circled these. You so these are these are a series of um, Hajj uh, of uh, pilgrim cities that were built around the city, and these were the kind of the first mega projects. And these accommodation buildings uh, were uh, one were 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 built with the purpose of um, the swift transfer of pilgrims from from the airport or the sea, or the seaport to uh, to to Mecca. And what's interesting here, and I think this would be a, um, a good ending to our uh, our our uh, discussion, is the um, that this this particular part of the Hajj infrastructure was. Um, was used for was eventually used for the uh, the Indonesian and Malaysian uh, uh, mission for the Hajj. So uh, from the nineties up until it was demolished uh, last year, this was the point where uh, pilgrims would come in uh, between going to Mecca and going to Medina and then going back to their uh, to their respective cities. This was where they would gather. And there are really, <clears throat> once you speak to members of that community, they all relate to this building because it's a building where they used to come together, they used to exchange goods, and um, it was a it was a <clears throat> one of these really um, important um, cultural centers for for the city. Thank you so much for listening to us. <laughs> Thanks. That was really interesting. And before we turn over to Danny. I just want to ask you, I mean, you showed us plans which indicate, and I mean, a lot of what you spoke about is also clearly the result of a governmental vision to, to develop and modernize the city. But just briefly, how did ideas of modernity and architecture come to the city? I mean, how, I mean I've, I'm actually in Jeddah at the moment, and it's a city that to me, um, I can see lots of buildings that are built by indiv that individual families and that that some places you go and you find streets and streets and streets that all look the same. Because I think Jeddah is a city that shows you something different. It, it's much more, you get a sense that people built what they liked or that, I mean, so my question is in two parts. How, 
restrictive or, 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 or lax were building controls at that time? And secondly, what were the sources of ideas? I mean, how did ideas come to the person building a house, for example? I think, I mean, the, um, the, I mean, early on, the, I think the in major influences were mostly uh, coming from Egypt, the Levant, and um, maybe from, uh, from Iraq. And uh, these, this is where, because they, a lot of the, uh, a lot of the contractors and a lot of the architects were coming from these parts of the world. Um, <clears throat> so I think there is a very uh, strong influence with that. And you see that with, you know, with the balconies, you know, balconies were part of the traditional architecture. And you see that really in a lot of buildings uh, up, in, <clears throat> up until today, uh, mostly in the 70s and 80s though. Um, but I think the building, in terms of building regulations, the, uh, the, the first set of regulations really starts to come into play um, after the 1960s. Uh, that's when, that's when, you know, there was a, you know, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the Ministry of Municipal Affairs uh, becomes established. They start to, uh, you know, create a Saudi building code. And even then, the, Saudi, the code is really just about zoning and uh, density. So there is no uh, restriction in terms of um, architectural language or yeah, and I think I think the fact that Jeddah is a is a gateway into Mecca and Medina gave it kind of this leeway of, of a mixture of these different styles, uh, uh, this proximity to the water's edge. I mean, there are stories about Belad receiving driftwood from different places. So you have you have people. It's it's a melting pot. It's it's like what what we were talking with Danny about before before this lecture started about. The, the different tastes, the different flavors, the different architectural styles. Like it's, it, they're, they're, Jeddah always had this fluidity. So I think in its early development, uh, there was this kind of easiness about influence in modernity itself, in architecture itself, in building codes um, that made these things happen. There was an, an excitement, I think, and that excitement kind of infiltrated a, a few things um, and a lot of uh, different architects and, and let's say even the different laymen that were working there were able to influence different things um, quite quite simply, I think. And I think that that gives Jidda a very, um, it gives this, this gives it this rawness, which, which makes it a very interesting city. Thanks. I was thinking about you mentioned Egypt, and I was thinking about how ideas spread in Egypt in terms of architecture. And one of the ways in which ideas spread was through the cinema. Yeah. That there are many films that show, for example, like an old-fashioned family and the young cousin comes to live with, the old, with her and tells him, oh, he has to become more modern. And so he changes the way he goes and buys new clothes, shaves his mustache off. Yeah. And then transforms the house from kind of classical furniture to much more art deco and modernist, um, and has starts to have parties and things. And and you find one of the interesting things about films is that they often show you where who's designed the furniture, or where the furniture comes from, and it's usually a shop. So mm -hmm. part of the the deals that they had was that they would use furniture from sh furniture makers in return for them being able, being able to advertise for free. And so yeah. there's a lot. I mean, I think that this, this is also a period of increased advertising and media. And, and, and those are often tools in which the, the person building a house who's made some money gets inspired. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about. What is it that makes people build in the way that they do? Yeah. And I mean, travel is also another one, of course, that, that through the movement of people and through exposure. And I mean, I've looked at old Egyptian magazines and many oftentimes with respect to articles, their articles translated or someone they're quote, talking about, say, a Chicago skyscraper or something and what it means to live in a modern house. And so you don't necessarily need to have access to English or French or other languages 
mm. uh, to be able to be exposed to so what what someone saying in in the West. Mm. Yeah, I definitely think that's very interesting. Um, and so I, I imagine that in Jeddah, it's, it's also similar that ideas spread in those sorts of ways too. Definitely, and there were also outdoor cinemas um, uh, in the very in, in that early modernity stage. So I think there was probably a lot of influence from that. But also, there are. I mean, one interesting thing about such films is that they also sometimes show the transformation from poverty to wealth mm. as being the transformation from living in old build buildings to living in new buildings, which can also be a dangerous thing. And yeah. But it's, I think that that is, I mean, there, there are implicit ways in which people start to think we should live in a new building. It's much better than what we have. Yeah. And I think those, the sort of transformative rags to riches films where they show an old area being demolished and how, like rows and rows of um, apartment blocks that all look the same um, must have had a significant influence. Mm. But I think a lot of people from Jeddah actually, um, you know, were educated in uh, Egypt. They went to school or university. Um, they also, so I think that the influence, you know, I think especially in that early period is really there. Um, yeah. I think that there's a lot of similar narratives um, yeah. Egypt, in that Lebanon. context. Egypt, I think Egypt, Lebanon too as well. Well, maybe now we can turn to Danny, who can take yeah. us to a different part of the world, and we can think, learn a bit about the context of Indonesia and what was happening there, and then come back all together and um, reflect and discuss and compare and contrast. Thank you, Shave. Uh, should I start? Yeah. Yes, yeah, please do. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Shave, for the invitation of, of having this lecture. and. Uh, Hello, Abdul Rahman in Turkey. It's uh, really nice to to meet you guys here, and uh, hope we can have further discussion forward. I will uh, uh, share my screen. So I will I will uh, explain about I will try to explain about Indonesia, which is a very complex uh, narrative and very complex society. Um, it's a uh, it's a changing society. I always seen it that way, and I think that is the the better way to understand Indonesia and Indonesian architecture. If we want to have a full understanding of it, so I think the best way to start understanding about Indonesia and its architecture is to understand and to uh, realize the situation of pre nation and before nation after nation is established. This is a two different situation where uh, before there is a nation, there's not a single authority that govern the life of this archipelago. And so by that, the architecture of pre-nation in the archipelago is very much different because the uh, creation of the architecture is rules by ethnic authority. So that is why we have so many different types of architecture from the west side of Indonesia to the east side of Indonesia, whose difference is quite extreme. This is, uh, for example, a architecture in Java, uh, which has influence from the Hindu uh, culture and also uh, governed by uh, kingdom uh, state of uh, authority. This is different. This is a tribal a hunter gatherer state of authority uh, that creates a different type of, of architecture. So in this life before a nation, architecture grows differently, created differently, and there are extreme differences in an area that is actually not too different, uh, not too far away. Uh, and and uh, how it is made and how it is created, the source of materials, it's a completely different way of making buildings and a completely different way of life than when uh, the nation established. One of the ethnic groups that come and create authority on the archipelago is the Europeans. Uh, the Portuguese, uh, the Dutch, and the Brits is, uh, have visited the archipelago since the 16th century. It started with the Portuguese, and then all the way came uh, the Dutch and then the Brits. But then the Dutch had the longest occupation. They settled uh, the longest in the archipelago. They created industry and um, all sort of 
types of architectural typology that could never be created by any other ethnic groups on the archipelago at that time. And this European architecture that was brought by the Dutch is the fundamental of the modern architectural knowledge that birthed me, uh, the modern Indonesian architect, as you can say, because of the establishment of uh, a school, a technical school in a city called Bandung in the island of Java. And uh, this building in particular is designed by a Dutch architect called Henry McLean Pond, uh, one of uh, a few Dutch architects who thinks that uh, even the Dutch should build the way in similar to the way that the other ethnic groups, the native, uh, that's what they call it, the native built. So this is the design that McLean Pond did for the Technical Hogo School Bandung that is the early beginning of architectural school in Indonesia and then the source of architectural knowledge that uh, modern architects in Indonesia today used. In 1945, when we established a nation, a singular authority uh, then born, uh, not just a single singular authority, but also a new identity because uh, now uh, every other ethnic groups uh, who has lived in Indonesia for generations, not only could they can call themselves as part of their own ethnic group, but they can now call themselves an Indonesian. Indonesia, by the way, is uh, a name that was made by a British Navy officer back in 1850. And so after Indonesia established uh, the Indonesian architects who graduated from uh, the Technical Hogo School Bandung at that time still, they are uh, you know, exploring and trying to find a new identity for Indonesian architecture. What is Indonesia? And uh, how can we best represent the identity of Indonesia through architecture? What type of architecture uh, should we make? There wasn't a uh, stability in the politics of Indonesia until 1959. So in 1961, the government created a development plan that uh, called the Universe Conspire Development Plan. And this is the development plan that then gave birth to the, um, I would say the best probably representation of Indonesian, uh, what is Indonesian architecture um, uh, that is uh, up until today, I think. Uh, one of the most important thing about what is Indonesia is to become a neutral. Uh, identity. Uh, Indonesia cannot be, uh, what is Indonesia cannot represent um, any other ethnic group's identity um, that has already uh, established in Indonesia. So it needs to have uh, a neutral shape and then uses materials that um, has never been used by any other ethnic group, which is concrete. Um, and then it should uh, give a different um, how you call it, impression. And it's not nothing similar to what other ethnic groups in Indonesia has. In 1965, uh, we have a military regime by uh, an army general. He runs the country, basically the army runs the country for uh, 30, 30, 90, 60, 32 years, from 65 to 98. And um, during this occupation, the, during this regime, not occupation, during this regime, there's the first economical boom because the, um, the regime, the new order regime we call, they allowed um, foreign investment to come to Indonesia. And this is um, uh, implicate, implicated in the rise of economy that Indonesia has. And uh, provide pro opportunity for more architects to build. This is the era where um, a lot, many architects work in huge architecture office. So the practice during this era is huge practices. One architectural office can have workers up to 300, 400, 500 people. And um, it's not many architecture firm at this time, but if there are few of them are very, very high, uh, very, have a very, very huge uh, numbers of workers. And the explorations that architect exploration that comes during this time is more about the representation of tropical architecture. 
And the dialogue about Indonesian architecture and what is Indonesia is no longer what is neutral, but how uh, an ethnical representation could be represented in in architecture uh, in a in a contemporary way. Sorry. Um, the rise of uh, that economy also gave birth to uh, working class. So we have a lot of uh, people or uh, Indonesians that is changed from uh, members of ethnic groups who uh, used to uh, do uh, ag agriculture and agrarian society into a working class society. And this situation uh, combined with the inability of uh, the government to provide or to govern uh, its people to live, to create a, a good living space, created in a city that is uh, built by single landed houses so because uh, the government doesn't provide housing. So everybody has to provide houses uh, on their own. And for those who are not able to uh, provide houses for their own, um, the, you know, there's big developers and uh, housing property developers. This is the era, the birth of the huge developers in Indonesia and also the era where generic houses like this are sprawling everywhere throughout the city. This is how Indonesian cities uh, currently are, are uh, looking, uh, looking like. In 1998, we have an economical crisis in Southeast Asia and the government was toppled, uh, toppled down, the uh, military regime was taken down. And um, this is also the time where we have uh, a new norm in architectural practice in Indonesia from what is a company, big company with a lot of uh, workers became uh, micro practices. So after 1998, the norm of uh, small practices with one, two, or very few, six, eight uh, workers are becoming the norm in Indonesia. And because there are so many houses and a lot of people needed houses, Houses becomes the first entry project for a lot of Indonesian architects at that time. This is a house designed by Adi Purnomo, uh, one of my former employer, uh, very nice house. It's a different way of creating house in Indonesian context. This is still also a house uh, by him. Um, the architect exploration doesn't take only doesn't only take influence from the way of the ethnic groups live, but also from abroad. This house in particular was very much influenced by uh, my, uh, my uh, a house designed by Philosophie, uh, Philosophie by Le Corbusier, and the, the concept of uh, infinity and then continuity from the ground to the second floor is something that is um, very influential, especially in these two projects that I saw, uh, that I just shown. This is a private house of uh, Andra Matin, uh, an Indonesian architect. And this is also a house by Andra Matin, who is, uh, you can see there almost no resemblance towards uh, what uh, the ethnic groups uh, have built over the past centuries. This is a, a house by SUB, a uh, small practice in Indonesia as well. This um, our exploration of architecture after 1998 was especially you know, being generated or uh, being motorized by this group called the Young Indonesian Architects Group, a group who uh, started in the late 80s during the uh, regime of uh, Suharto, the New Order regime. And they created critical discussions and then they uh, created uh, open houses events so that they can be criticized among their peers. And they were the leading uh, voices, or the leading architects who kind of do the explorations, architect explorations in the late 80s until the mid 2000s, the 2010s. This is Andra Martin, uh, the younger version of Andra Martin, the architect who designed the house in which I just showed. These days is a, is a unique situation in Indonesian architecture because 
the um, orchid sector exploration in Indonesia is being uh, more or less being fueled by the birth of uh, retails uh, that was built by young Indonesians. Um, they are a different type of generation than the previous generation. If the previous generation was come from working class uh, generation, this generation was an entrepreneur uh, generation, and they demanded a higher quality of design, better quality of life, and they are the the fundamental difference is that this generation now able to create products. Uh, one uh, traits that the previous generation is lacking. And so with this, they try to um, allow younger Indonesian architects who is uh, very productive these days to uh, open up space for them uh, for explorations. Um, another situation in Indonesia that we have is the, the declining living quality in cities that Indonesia has. Indonesia has uh, 27 cities uh, with population uh, more than 1 million. And Java is an island the size of uh, the state of New York, but contain the population of 130 million people at the moment. So uh, with this situation that we currently have, there, are, there have been um, efforts to create a better living space in, in a neighboring island outside of Java. This is in particular is, uh, the project that we're currently working in Studio Dasar in my office. And this is a new city in the island of Sumatra, a neighboring island from, from Java. And uh, this uh, quest for a better living space um, has allowed uh, us to explore how can we live better in, in Indonesia and how can we build better as a society. And uh, this is uh, something that we're currently working on. And this new city, new living space is also now become space for a different, for another architectural exploration, uh, because basically we can still reshape the regulation in the area. This is uh, another Islamic center built by uh, the architect Andra Matin. Uh, this is a, uh, a gallery uh, that we designed there, uh, a mosque by Andra Matin. And this is a uh, an office, government office by a lab studio. Uh, this is Islamic center compound by Andra Matin. And uh, the first one was a stadium by uh, Hanawal and Partners, uh, Indonesian architects as well. So the city is called Tubaba and it's currently a work in process. Uh, they have opened the first four kilometers of the main road and it's still uh, going on uh, at the moment. So uh, as I mentioned before, uh, Indonesian architects, young Indonesian architects at the moment are very uh, productive. I have never, uh, I, I don't remember any period in Indonesia uh, for as long as I live that Indonesian architects has been this very, very productive. And one of the means that they have used to boost this productivity is, is Instagram. Uh, and if you wanted to know further about what Indonesian architects are doing, it's, it's uh, you, you can find it uh, through hashtag, the democratization of uh, publication and also um, the platform where everybody can be seen by everyone. So with that, I conclude my presentation about uh, Indonesian architecture, the architecture of a changing society. Uh, thank you very much, Danny. Before we have a general discussion, actually, I wanted to ask you to what extent, I mean, you spoke about um, different regional architectures and then this idea of a uniform one that was neutral. To what extent did this neutrality, I mean, to what extent was it widespread? And secondly, to what extent did it incorporate spatial patterns and other things from the more geographically specific and ethnically specific architecture? Um, the, actually, that actually kind of stopped after 1965, the effort to create neutrality, because uh, it was associated with communism. Uh, the thing with Indonesia in 1961, we are a socialist uh, republic, so the Repo Socialist Republic of Indonesia. That was in 61 until 65. 
So this type of architecture was always being associated with uh, that era. And that era is associated with communism. And in 65, one of the uh, factor that made um, uh, the new order, the army regime uh, came to power is because uh, the, the, the filibying of the communist party. So all of that was, was gone, actually, the, the effort to create a neutral identity for Indonesia. And after 1965, it was about how to modernize ethnic identity through architecture. It's, it's about that. And the creation of a neutral identity was, was thought of something that is very foreign, as, as very far, and somehow there's a feeling that it is taboo. After 1998, it was different. The exploration was different. And um, what, what's, what's very, have a huge implication on the life of Indonesian people through architecture is actually not 61 to 65 on the neutrality uh, of the identity, but it was on uh, 65 until 68 when the army general came to power. He was inserting and asserting uh, Javanese culture uh, identity to buildings on all parts of, of uh, Indonesia. And he changed the way that the ethnic groups is making houses and making buildings through uh, the um, enforcement of uh, so-called decent housing. So what is being called as decent housing uh, is a house that is built by bricks and mortars and not uh, through woods or bamboos and, and the natural materials. And this was, this was huge. And also the, the, the biggest architectural uh, policy that this archipelago has ever seen, I think, is the introduction of uh, presidential instruction elementary school. So this elementary school was built throughout the archipelago for 24 years. There are 200,000 of these schools being built all around the archipelago. And this uh, school is basically teaching the, the idea of Indonesia and then the uh, values of, of nationalism. And uh, this is, I think, uh, what is more changing for the society than the neutral architectural identity that was tried to be, to be established in 61 to 65. Thank you. But do you think the ideas of nationalism, when they mm. translate in architecture, are they translated, um, do they derive from something that most people see as part of their identity or is it something that someone's decided this is our identity. All our buildings should look like this. Because sometimes you get that, that, that there's a big gap between the state and how it sees identity in, vi yeah. vi in visual form and how the average person actually thinks of it. I, I agree. Uh, and in, in Indonesia, I think that you have to go through different periods. Different periods have different understanding. In 61 to 65, in this period, Indonesia is a new identity. It's a different identity. You can be, uh, for instance, I'm, a, I'm from a tribe called Javanese tribe, an ethnic group called Javanese. In 161 to 65, I can still be a Javanese, a full Javanese, without having any traits of an Indonesian. And after 65, as impossible. To be an Indonesian, uh, to be an Indonesian, then you have to somehow left your Javanese uh, life. Um, for one instance, you cannot speak with Javanese language anymore. That's the most basic. And then when you go to uh, an Indonesian school, then you are imbued with uh, an ability, a skill that are not, uh, no longer allows you able to live in the Japanese society place of, of life anymore. You have to move out to Jakarta, uh, for instance, uh, the bigger metropolis, where your skill can be valued and you can, you can uh, barter it with money. So it's, it's in different stages of life in Indonesia has a different um, approach and, and different understandings about that. One time you're, uh, you have an option, after 65, you have 
you no longer have an option because just because the government kind of push you to become Indonesian. And after uh, 65, in after 98, it's it's no longer an option. It's the only thing that you know. So you become that. And then because you never really understand about the past, you try to be you try to find what is Indonesia through um, uh, through taking other people's past. Like we try to become uh, Japanese and we try to become Americans. We try to become Europeans uh, just because we don't know how it was to become uh, members of uh, of our ethnic groups in the in the past. Thanks. That's a really fascinating insight. Well, Thank I you. wondered, Abderrahman and Turki, whether you have any comments for Danny and about the Indonesian example and how it's different or similar to your own experience with Jeddah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just curious, Danny, to ask, I mean, are there, you were talking about these kind of borrowing from different cultures, but also about your experience with the Japanese um, um, architecture. Um, are there any um, sort of restrictions or, or guidances or, um, I don't know, um, in, in, in sort of, even in the images that you've shown or, or in your practice now in sort of a style that you would call Japanese in... in a style? A, a, st a modern style of Japanese architecture. Would you identify this? Oh. People work there in, in that particular style um, or is it identifiable at all? Or is it just in a very subtle way imbued within um, within the, the vast majority of, of architecture in Indonesia, in, in Indonesia or some more so in... Um, in, oh, in, in yeah. the, the, you mean the representation of Javanese uh, architecture in modern Indonesian uh, society? Contemporary, in, in, in architecture itself, in yeah. contemporary architecture or in early modernity, late modernity, I don't know. Oh, there, there's uh, especially in in the late in early eighties, mid eighties, that representation starts with the roof, uh, the usage of roof tiles, uh, mm -hmm. and the the design of buildings with huge spans of of roof, just like the mosque uh, that I that I showed. Yeah. That could be said as the contemporary uh, take on a Javanese architecture. And also on the on the building, the six uh, stories building that I, I showed, um, it it started with the roof. Uh, what the what the government of uh, New Order, the army government, tried to export to other uh, society in Indonesia is the roof, the usage of big roof, and they built that through the buildings of government's office. Um, of Indonesia. So there's a lot of Indonesian government office in different cities, uh, which, you know, sometimes they don't use uh, roof tiles. They don't know what roof tile is. And then the central government just put a huge government office with roof tiles there, huge roof tiles that had, they have never seen before. And uh, I think this exports of roofs is, is something that is very Japanese because mm -hmm. Japanese architecture is very much known uh, with the roof tiles. Even though you see in another ethnic groups that I, I showed, there's really an exploration of roofs, different types of roofs, but um, usually it's not roof tiles. Roof tiles is very unique to, to Java. Uh, in Sumatra, it's a different type. There's, they use bamboo or haze, um, but in Java, we have uh, uh, a roof tile technique building uh, construction material. And do you find it, do, do you use it in your practice now in, in current oh. projects? Yes, yes. In, in cool. several of our, our projects, we use that because that became a, a gen generic material mm. that is very, very prominent and available everywhere in Indonesia. Uh, every common people can use it. Uh, every architect can, can use it and every, every architect can, can explore, do architectural exploration with it. It's, it becomes very, very generic and becomes a very general, general construction material for Indonesian architecture. I think maybe that kind of, maybe I see um, someone called Hafiza asking, um, 
I'm just sort of curious to date what is one project that you were most excited to work with and why? Um, and they were discussing local materials and really understanding the local context. What are some of the materials that you really enjoy working with or find very fascinating and uh, innovative? So I guess mm. maybe that's already answering this. Do you find this material as something that's fascinating and, and innovative or is there no. another material you find more exciting? <laughs> um, I... I... At the moment, I'm trying to work with plywood and and uh, hollow steels. Uh, we design uh, some houses with 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters hollow steel. And uh, we're currently trying to design a house uh, that uses no brick walls, but uh, just try to explore with how plywood can, can be applied. And then uh, glue lamb materials uh, is something that we're currently uh, looking at. And uh, for uh, for a project that I am most excited to work is the city that I, I showed. And and why? Because I want to get out of Jakarta. I couldn't bear living in the city anymore. I need a different living space to live for my old uh, old life. So uh, yeah, it's 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 one one that I'm I'm excited to work on. Well, well, what about you? What about you guys? Uh, I mean, well, what are well, what are those? I think we, I mean, I think with every project, we always um, we always kind of find uh, interesting material that uh, that we develop as really as part of the con conceptual uh, framework of the uh, of the project. So, but I think one of the materials that we were excited to work with is uh, rammed earth. Um, rammed mm -hmm. earth and exper we were experimenting with different techniques of applying rammed earth and using different uh, kind of ratios of sand, cement, and maybe and also experimenting with adding some um, some other additives uh, that give it a different type of color or texture. So working on a cultural project in uh, in an area called the Dada in uh, kind of the northwest part of Saudi. Uh, very kind of colorful mountains, uh, beautiful area that kind of shares the same aquifer system as Petra, uh, which was used by the Nabataeans, uh, Nabataean civilizations in the past. Um, and we've been trying to develop this material uh, with, with round earth or also proposing if we can, um, if, if we end up um, using foundations, if we excavate the uh, excavate the land. We maybe are able to use the sand uh, as an admixture for the concrete uh, admixture. Uh, so we've been trying to be very experimental with these things uh, and really to try to be playful. And we're actually doing um, doing a residency in Berlin and ends tomorrow. Um, so we have been uh, trying to explore gestures of uh, of glass. So. We just did this cast today. The color didn't turn out to be that great. Oh. No. This is supposed to be orange. Um, but we did these, which is actually one of the motifs Sif, that we're talking about. So this is a motif that comes from Egypt. So we've been experimenting with this. Um, it's for another uh, competition that we're applying for. Um, but yeah, it's a fun material that we're having fun with. Here at the residency. Very nice. We thought we should show it's it. It's really, that. really nice. And it's uh, still setting, but it's quite fun. <laughs> um, so, yeah, yes, I, I hope that answers your question from both of us. Yeah. So, happy <laughs> uh, Let me see if there are any questions from the attendees. So, Thank you, Fabiza, for your question. If there are other questions, can you please type them in the chat box and uh, we'll discuss them and answer them. But in the meantime, I'll ask you about how important is history in the modern expressions of architecture in Jeddah and uh, Indonesia? I mean, do people care about the past or um, is it something that isn't very significant to most people? I'll start with Turkan Abdurrahman and then go to Dan. Um, I think, I mean, in, I think the modern history of uh, Jeddah has uh, 
it was really you know not an interesting topic for many people um and until recently when these radical changes have been happening around the city it's really becoming more and more uh discussed and more and more relevant yeah. relevant in that sense so i would say I mean, if you ask me six or seven years ago and no one really cared um but now i think we see that <clears throat> We see a lot of people who are curious and uh, we see a lot of uh, adaptive use of buildings. Um, and also, I mean, just uh, when we organized that tour of the 19, uh, uh, 1970s building on Philistine Street with you and your uh, team, uh, Sif, that was already, uh, that a lot of people showed up and that was uh, a kind of just, you know, a lot of people showed interest and that shows that they the attitude is changing uh, and uh, people are understanding the value of this. Um, so I don't know how it is in uh, Indonesia, but I would assume that there is a bit more, uh, I think it's a, it's a bit more developed, uh, this, kind of, this kind of work on modern architecture. Yeah, um, our, our our relationship with the past is problematic, to say, to say the least, uh, in Indonesia. And uh, as, as I mentioned in, in my lecture, uh, it's, it's a changing society. So there are some people who change. There are some people who aren't changed. And uh, even those who aren't radically changed still uh, uh, having some, some form of changes in, in their lives. Um, I mentioned about the ethnical society. Um, they are still uh, present in, in parts of Indonesia at the moment. They have their own past. And then if you talk about if you, what you meant was uh, people like, like myself who, who are professional architects and how we relate to the past. And I have to say, it's it's not a it's it's uh, not not a situation that is is uh, good for us because the education system that the new order regime, the army general, has created for us is a fundamental of education that uh, severs us with the past, and we even it's hard for us to kind of have an instinct to connect to the past. Uh, but having said that. Um, it's the, the 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 relationship of people like me, Indonesians, uh, Maori Indonesians, to the past is is complicated because we have at least three types of of pasts. Uh, we have ancestral past, which is the past of our our ethnic groups' lives, our ancestors' uh, life. This past is to a lot of young people like me, uh, a lot of Indonesians is almost gone now we don't have any connections to that kind of life anymore that that ancestral past that we have the second is our national past it's the past of our uh, indonesian identity uh, which is a lot of it our lives <laughs> given to us and uh, the in terms of relation to architecture um there's a lot of things that that can be talked about, especially uh, that a bit the, that intention to create neutral identity, and then the intention to create uh, an ethnical imbued uh, identity. It's uh, another different thing, and the, the third thing is a type of past that now many young Indonesians are more alluded to, which is acquired past. This is the the past of other people. Uh, the Japanese past, the European past, the Swiss past that we uh, choose to study. And then we decided to, oh, I'm going to take this as my past and I'm going to build contemporary based on this past. So we built uh, like the Japanese and we, really be, we built like uh, the Swiss or, or any other uh, culture that we decided to acquire the, this type of past. So... Um, our relationship to the past, uh, well, it's it's problematic maybe because then it created uh, a, a practice uh, that is very eclectic in, in Indonesia at the moment. Uh, you can no longer see the traits. I mean, I, I'm a little bit I'm, I'm envious uh, to a society like uh, Abdurrahman and in Turkey uh, came from where you know you don't really change a lot. You kind of evolve. 
and us, we had gone through radical changes and also the events of, uh, you know, generations just severed a uh, past of another generation, which has been in a way damaging, but in another way liberating because it creates freedom for us to kind of just take cultures from, from anywhere and everywhere and uh, do uh, an architectural exploration that is today, I can say, very free and uh, in so many ways very eclectic. But then if you... Uh, if you if you're hoping a singular identity like a middle middle eastern architecture uh, to be same like indonesian architecture it's impossible now we cannot define a single type of style as indonesian architecture it has grown and evolved so very diversely because of uh, the acquired past that we chose to take rather than the ancestral past and the national past I mean, the grass is always greener, Danny. <laughs> it always is. <laughs> it's always is, doesn't it? <laughs> well, there's a question about the development of Jeddah comparing to Riyadh, for example. Um, are different cities in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia developing in the same way or in different ways, architecturally, in urban terms? I think very differently. Um, I think especially especially if you compare it to Riyadh. Riyadh is, I think, is one of the largest uh, cities um, in uh, in Saudi, if not the largest city. No, Riyadh is the largest um, city. It's and the history of its development is uh, very uh, is very interesting because the the modernization of Riyadh really starts off with the master planner um, and <clears throat> it starts off with the Doxiadis master plan and and you can see that development in in, in the capital is very uh, is very institutionalized and um, and you know there's a lot of uh, large scale projects landmark projects you know that really form part of the identity of the city so you have a large project like you know the diplomatic quarter and then <clears throat> And then you have, um, you know, and then you have other large, uh, you know, university campuses. And you have the um, Riyadh Gate development, and I think, especially now in the coming future, um, Riyadh is really uh, has really a more um, a more you know articulated idea about the direction of its development because. Um, a for 50 years it was under the governance of uh, King Salman. He was the mayor of Riyadh, and he had a very specific, um, you know, identity um, that uh, that he made sure to establish in the city and the contemporary architecture that was being built. And also the uh, and also I think that the bureaucracy is very different because the Riyadh also um, because the. A Riyadh Development Authority was established um, a few decades ago, and that has really been one of the major um, uh, facilitators for a kind of robust and systematic um, approach to all of these different projects. So you get a very sensible identity in terms of, you know, color palette, uh, morphology, and um, and kind of articulation. Um, and in Jeddah, it's it's a bit more eclectic. So there is, you know, it's kind of like, a, as you said earlier, it's, you know, build what you like. Um, and it's, I think it's also kind of this, and I think it also reflect, it reflects also the, uh, the social kind of, uh, the social differences. I think that the society in Jeddah is very, um, is very diverse. They have come from very different backgrounds, um, and and you know just two, one or two generations ago, um, and in Riyadh, I think it's mostly um, Saudi nationals or people that or people who moved to Riyadh from the surround the immediate surroundings. So you can you can tell the difference. I think, uh, yeah, great. Um, there's also a question about what does architecture mean to you 
the three of you. Um, last year, we were discussing the danger of thinking about architecture for architecture's sake and the idea of design versus thinking about the built environment. The design of buildings, I suppose, and, and the idea of thinking about the larger built environment and also the balance between clients' needs and utility and sustainability. Um, so the question is, what does architecture mean to you? And in your own design, what are the things that are very important to you? Is it light? Is it the environment? Is it creating wonder or feeling of space? Or I mean, what do you try to achieve within your own design practices? So we'll start with Danny and then Turki and Abdurrahman. Oh, this is the toughest question. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know how to answer. I'm going to try to answer this um, because I think um, I, in, I've been working alone since 2000, uh, 2010, since 2010. And um, so that's almost, almost 15 years, uh, two years to 15 years. And um, what I've realized in the past, in, in these past years is that um, I never really I never really pursue making buildings, but uh, the the motive of my of my work was always about doing things that uh, that hasn't been done before by by anyone, and this is still in the field of architecture. So uh, it's it's not only about about um, making the buildings, but I curate, I I publish books, I write. I um, I have a design festival. I I make city. I design a city because nobody else in my generation talks about it. So we do that. And so um, architecture for me now is not buildings anymore. Though I still design buildings. I I still make. I design houses. We we uh, we design monuments and and we do that. Uh, but it's 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 less about that and it's more about the the ecosystem and and the climate and and in but by ecosystem and climate it's not about nature it's about it's about the the ecosystem of architectural practice it's it's a huge ecosystem and i think for us to to have a a good living space and and a, and a high quality living space and high quality uh, architecture you have to think about the 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 ecosystem of architecture it's the ecosystem of education the ecosystem of of uh, discourse and um, the ecosystem of publications uh, it's it's something that it needs to operate in in a certain quality to pro to produce a, a high quality that could produce uh, thinkers and practitioners that are willing to push uh, the society or other people to create a better and or, or high quality architecture, and so my work now more on this, more on on how I could help to create the uh, a better ecosystem of, of architecture in Indonesia, and not so much about making the building itself. But when I do make buildings, what I what I think first is not about what other people has done it's about what can be done or what hasn't been done before in terms of spaces how the space are connected so when 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 we design in in the studio i always talk to my team that we need to think about how the people inside of the space what do you want them to feel? How do they connect it? What do they see? How other approach them? How they approach other? How they move in the, in the space? How they transition from outside to inside? What do you want them to, to feel? Every, every typology um, requires and, and has the potential to create different feelings. To, to people. So it is this feeling that I always tell to my, my team to look at what is the feeling that we want other people to, to feel. 
and uh, what is the sensation that we want other people to to feel and by understanding this feeling because we have experienced it ourselves by understanding this then we be, we understand how big of openings that we want to create uh, how far of space how big of space are we want to create how far do we want people to travel how fatigued do we want them to feel or how energized or how easy do we want them to to feel when they reach to a, a certain place it's always about this because when you when when you think back again um architecture is always about uh you know what feelings we remember when we arrive to a certain certain architecture or certain buildings and when we talk about feelings what what i what i realize now is that when we talk about feelings to clients they tend to understand easier than when we talk about oh this is going to be iconic the you can look at this in a certain place it's and, and it's going to look really magnificent uh but if you talk about you know imagine yourself sitting in this space it's 8 meters high and 4 meters wide it's approximately uh, as big as your room and then the opening is 10 meters and it looks to the west and then you can see the sun coming in you can feel touches uh the skin it warms a little bit it it tends to have um uh, a more welcoming response from the client then the discussion would be about things that could be reduced uh the materials can we change the materials uh, uh or, or the the shape of uh, of of the ceramics can we can we make it smaller but it doesn't affect the quality of the space too much and i think um more and more uh uh Uh, the, the way I run my practice and the way I design building, it's it's more and more towards that. It's it's so much easier to talk to a client when you talk about how a building operates than how a building looks. Thanks. That was a really fascinating answer. And oh, thank you. <laughs> that answer, answer the question says she loved it to go inward and build outward. Yeah. Okay. Abdul Rahman and Turki. I, I for us we we share the same thing like we're we're a multidisciplinary practice uh we work on publications for us it's all about sharing knowledge um uh and i mean as as you saw in our proposal like in our presentation we uh we archive we we really try to to work with the community in many things and that kind of infiltrates our practice um more and more we try in our practice to even um think of I think something that has been interesting us for a while is architecture without architects um to kind of strip away our ego from architecture so it's i mean some of our architectural trademarks uh, i mean i think um really what we're, what what we're trying to do is to reuse buildings um and i think that's more of a global a uh, conversation that we've been noticing is happening all over the world um in in the middle east and in europe and in different parts of the world it's it's let's let's not build anymore let's try to reuse buildings and try to have in contemporary interventions within them uh with with minimal um demolitions um so i think that's that's something that really um can give a space um another life and that's something that's uh that's quite poetic um and gives poetry and that breathes a new life into a building i think is something that's quite powerful um it's it's really creating a new narrative um reusing new buildings is something that's that transcends this idea of um this this realm and kind of sticking to sustainability and and lead and all of these things if if you can reuse uh, a space if you can reuse a book if we can reuse a material whatever it might be architecture exists in many different formats it's the way um the way a publication is written the way you can work with the community um an architecture is something that's so malleable um it can be philosophical it can be um it can be material it can be how you work with a contractor to realize a project and I'll leave the rest for Turkey maybe to see a little bit more yeah i mean i think it's 
I think, and I think I mean, this kind of negotiation with the client and the client needs and the project needs and the technical requirements, I think these are all interesting kind of, um, I don't want to say restraints, but in, uh, influences on how the design develops. And I think it's, uh, well, I think it's always, uh, I think it's, these challenges make these projects more exciting. And it also kind of reminds you that, you know, there is no, you know, there is no sort of single mind that can create the building and develop the architecture, even though that's, you know, um, I think that's what what we uh, what we tend to believe because, you know, there are famous architects, so, and, you know, their names, the Zahadids, the Norman Fosters, but in reality, it's a big team that is really needed to create something. There are, and ideas really come out of discussions, so even though, you know, a Norman Foster is never really just a Norman Foster alone. It's just, you know, the brand. But there are many different people who are, who work on this. And um, and I think that that's when, you know, that's when design also becomes um, more exciting, um, I believe. And do you find good responses to the idea of reusing buildings? Or is it hard to convince people? Because in some societies, People are less interested in all in existing buildings are much more interested in new things. Um, to be honest, I think there is becoming it's still not common. You know, most most people come in and say, no, let's just remove this and build something brand new. Um, but I think that through example, uh, we've man we we managed to sort of show that this is what you can do with an existing structure. Um, and again, I think it's it is a global issue. I think the more the more architects that do this all over the world, it's a collective effort. The more people do it, the more we can lead by example. You know, and you know when you talk about the narrative, you talk about the sort of different layers of um, occupation, and uh, and it, it creates a very creates a much more interesting environment when you preserve rather than demolish and obviously each project is a different case you know you, you can't you know if someone comes to you and they want like a multi-story uh, apartment block and you have a house in the, on that plate but on that same plot then you know you can't really negotiate but um, I think that there are more instances where people are finding abandoned or unused uh, buildings that are already existing and proposing to repurpose them. Um, <clears throat> so, sorry. I think it's important to do so because sometimes people lack the imagination to see the potential use of a building or reuse so that actually you don't have to remove it. You can, all it needs is some remodeling or painting. And I think those examples are really important because they actually show you the, pos the possibility of transformation. Yeah, and maybe to Danny's point about how do you convey to to people and to clients in a way that makes them understand it, and maybe the sense of how how this how a space will feel or make them feel um, is a good way of in, enabling their imagination. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so because uh, sensations is something that everybody uh, have in common. You, we we uh, we share happiness. We share uh, same feelings of uh, fascination towards something. Uh, heat is something that we are we know what it feels like. And uh, uh, the sun when it hits our skin or our face, it's it's a familiar feeling that a lot of people uh, can can feel. So when we talk uh, with when we talk with clients uh, with this very basic language of of uh, of daily life and how how to create that in a contained um, environment that they can themselves build with their own money, it's uh, it's it's a communication that we we find uh, in in our projects uh, quite effective and 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 after that. We, if we were to try to insert our own agenda in in the in the design, it's a little bit more possible. Uh, it has a, a bigger chance of it to be successful, um, and and um, it's it's something that we we tried more and more, 
and uh, we tried to always, uh, at least in the few few projects in the past few few projects that we have, uh, we try to to do it in in this way and try to create the design um, in in this way, and and try to communicate with with the client also in 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 this way and. Um, well, so far it's it's good. We have a few houses that we're currently working on with very minimal revision, and they are happy with the basic idea. <laughs> and uh, and I well, so far it's so good. So maybe we're going to continue with that method forward. <laughs> Great. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, the three of you, for giving us such valuable insights into the trajectory of modern architecture in two very different places that are also interlinked. Um, and thank you to our listeners and for all of your questions, which have been very engaging and thought provoking. Actually, next week's session is about identity um, in, in, in contemporary architecture related to the Muslim world and Muslim communities. So um, it will follow up very nicely, I think, from the sorts of issues that we've been discussing today about the path of modernity. Um, and just to remind you, this is an eight-session free online course organized by SOAS, the Aga Khan Trust for Cultures Education Department, and the Barca Trust. And so I hope that you'll stay with us for the remaining six sessions. And thank you once again uh, to Danny and to Abdurrahman and Turki. And I hope you. your last day in Berlin is an enjoyable one. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much. It's been an enjoyable discussion. Yeah, thank, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Bye.